Now it's a pleasure to invite here the last speaker of this session, who is uh, Dr. Duccio Malini. He's the head of quantitative biology for Novartin Vaccine and Diagnostics in uh, Siena. So we will go to biology, I guess. Kind of. Kind of biology. Okay. Strange to use this. Thanks. I am really uh, flattered, honored, uh, a little bit embarrassed for being here today. Uh, what I do is, uh, is vaccine research. I've been working for uh, 13 or 14 years now in a fantastic place in Siena, uh, a research institute in vaccinology that was founded uh, in the early years of the last century from uh, Achilles Clavo and uh, he was a scholar of Louis Pasteur coming back from Paris to establish vaccinology and in, uh, in Italy. And this place has been uh, a place where the history of vaccinology, if you like, has been uh, developed and some of the big achievements that uh, humanity has gone through in, in the attempt to fight infectious diseases has actually happened there and uh, the last one in temporal order of these achievements has been a vaccine uh, against uh, bacterial meningitis that we have licensed a few months ago for the European Medical um, Agency. So if, if it's like that, if it's a story of successes, why am I here today? So what's, what can we do? What's, what's the next step? I'm here today, um, well, first of all, because of the, as I said, flattering, embarrassing, and very kind invitation of Ciro, Alex, and, and, and Mario. But I'm here today because I think that vaccinology is now at a turning point. And um, that's what I would like to convince you about now. Why, why is it a turning point? Um, I, I don't have to convince you that infectious diseases are a serious threat for humanity, but maybe we are not all completely aware, uh, for example, that the fact that we are getting older and older, which I think it's a good thing, we're living longer. A lot of people are scared about it, I'm not, I'm happy. Uh, statistically, I'm supposed to live longer than my ancestors, but this is changing a lot, the shape of the interaction between host and pathogen. We know nothing about the immune system of humans after 55, 60 years of age. We have no idea. We begin to see things that work quite differently from the immune system of adolescents or younger adults, but we're just learning now to discover how this immune system works. And then we have the huge challenges of infectious diseases associated with poverty. And, and so there's a lot of things to do but what's changing now, what's making this a, really a turning point, is uh, a challenge that comes from what really a vaccine is. And this is, uh, th there's going to be two words which have been used a lot, and I'm trying humbly to use them just to address some simple concepts. One, it's obviously complexity. The other one is, is data. It's, it's starting from data. And, and I'll try to drive you in, in the next uh, Hopefully, hopefully like five or six minutes through this idea. Uh, first of all, is this new in biology? Not at all. It's, it's all but new. It's 1934 that the second Cold Spring Arbor um, Symposium on Quantitative Biology. And it was already there, the knowledge that the more complex the biological problem, the more mathematics, physics, chemistry were needed to solve the problem. And, and what about data, data-driven approaches? It's uh, 1948, Ron Fisher, uh, founding the Biometric Society. We need to go to empirical data. That's the only way that we have to solve problems and start from there. So if it's not new, what's happening now? And I have to go to what a vaccine is to try to address this question. Uh, we think of a vaccine as um, like um, a singular event 
of some biological product that is injected into a human being. Well, that's not really what a vaccine is. A vaccine is something definitely more, uh, let me say complicated rather than complex. It's something that happens at the interaction between two definitely complex systems. One is the pathogen that we're trying to protect a human from, and a pathogen is not a single individual. A pathogen is a population of different individuals. Think of bacteria or viruses. It's really, you will have a hard time trying to find two bacteria of the same species that are giving the same disease, identical one to the other. They're not. And on the other hand side, you have the host, which is not an individual, it's a population. And inside each host, there's a very complex network of many different genes that are acting to react, to work, to produce. So vaccinating, it's basically trying to modulate the interaction between two complex systems. And this is where I think it's really the interesting part of the problem and the opportunity for the future. Let me give you a, a quick snapshot of what this means for these two different words and a few ideas of where we may want to concentrate our attention, attention in the near future. So let's start from the pathogen. Uh, the revolution in, in vaccinology is now uh, genomics. Genomics has completely changed the vaccinology. This is already old. The, the vaccine that I mentioned to you before was done, is the first vaccine that was done starting from the genomes. Uh, but that was a very simple idea. I determined the genome of a pathogen so that I know my enemy. Once I know my enemy, I know how to fight the enemy. And it worked. But at, in those days, 1998, the real challenge was to determine the genomic sequence of one individual. So think about it as this small circle, and on a genome you have different features. Now what happens in reality? Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. This is a famous quote, and Theodor Dobchansky, but that's really true, especially if you think about this. Evolution, which is working every day, every minute, by many different mechanisms, evolves the genome in real time. So you have diversity. The smaller population that you can think of, if you take a single bacterial cell and you grow the bacterial cell overnight on an agar plate, the simplest thing that you can think of, and the morning after you go and you sequence with uh, deep sequencing technologies like you can do today, and you will find a lot of polymorphisms in one night on a closed, uh, almost adiabatic system, and you find diversity there, starting from one cell. But then you have evolution by, with, which comes from the interaction of this individual with the rest of the environment. Other species, they can get genes from outside. So they can integrate exogenous material in their own DNA. And at the end of the day, you start it from one genome and you end up with a pan genome. When we started working with Chiro on this a few years ago, we discovered that when you look at the pan genome of a bacterial species, the rate of novelty that you discover by looking at more and more genomes from the same species, uh, it, it's like the rate of novelty that you uh, observe when you study um, a natural language. So it's a famous Hipp's law. Can you think about how, what kind of impact this has for somebody who's trying to develop a vaccine against these species? If you look at one individual, you have about 2,000 genes, once you have sequenced less than 15, you have almost three times the number of genes. So what's the species that you're trying to vaccinate against? How quick the species will find a way to circumvent your vaccine and to find an escape, uh, a way to escape your action? Now let's, let's move to the host. Uh, this is a quick snapshot of how vaccine development changed over the last 20 years and how is, we hopefully would like the, it to become in the next 10 years. In the early days, discovery it was very difficult. To find a new vaccine, a new molecule, a new antigen, used to take, well, this is even optimistic as a timeline, 10 years 
if you had a successful project. But you could stay there for 30, 40, 50 years still looking for the right antigen. Once you had the right molecule, then clinical development was rather quick. You test your molecule, if it works, it works, and then you, you move on in small sample sizes and you can get it to the market. Today, with reverse vaccinology, genomics, etc., discovery can be much shorter than this, but now we are spending a huge amount of time in clinical development because the sample size that you requested is larger and larger. So, in a way, this system is going big, but in the wrong direction. We're getting more and more data from more and more patients, but we're getting the wrong data from the patients that we try to immunize with our vaccines. So the idea is try to shrink down the time that is needed for clinical development by getting big data from patients, but in the right way. And, and this is basically the kind of proposal that I would like to bring here. And just to give you uh, only the concept without going into the details here, this is what I consider the ancestor of this approach. This is small. It's small data. It's really an example of small data. It's a small phase one trial, flu, H5N1. Here you see two numbers that you can read from a patient is antibodies, which means will I be protected from disease or will I not? Will I get flu or will I, do, will I avoid getting flu? And T cell response, which is the cellular machinery that in a way is behind the activation of the pathway that at the end of the day gives you antibodies. Now look at the temporal profile of the response. It's kind of similar. So you would say they're moving together. That's not true. If you look at the cellular response after 20 days from vaccination and the antibody response eight months or 18 months after vaccination, by looking at what happened to the cellular response after 20 days, you can predict whether the subject will be protected or not in months or in years. And this is true after the first dose that you gave. So it's, in a way, it's something that goes along the line of predicting success. So think about a clinical trial. Instead of enrolling tens of thousands of people because I won't, and, and following them for one or two years on a clinical program, I can discover immediately, after a few days, which of these subjects will be successful. And I can already know whether it's worth at all to go on on a clinical program. And I can stop now, because it's hopeless. Or I can focus my investigation on those subjects which I'm interested in. I may be interested in a positive or in a negative response, but at least I know what's happening. OK, this is the basic concept, but what I think we can do now is move to the next step in this kind of investigation. And the next step comes from going by reading two numbers from each subject to reading hundreds of thousands of numbers from each subject. And this is what gives us really uh, a dramatic change in the power that we have. So from each subject, we can read in uh, uh, minutes after the vaccination, hours, days, we can read tens of thousands of genetic responses quite easily. It's easy to do this now. We're doing this with the NIH and, and with Seattle Biomed. It's really easy. And you can classify the response according to the different compounds that you have used in your trial and what people is doing now, this is already real, is just uh, with standard data mining techniques, going one gene, one gene by one gene, or pairs of genes, or triplets of genes, trying to find predictors, okay? Classifiers that can tell you who will be the high responders and who will be the low responders. The same concept as before. Now the next step here is that since you have found some gene, you can have a functional inference in why that guy is going to be a, a good responder. What has happened to his immune system? 
So what that compound is act really activating, why it works, this is the huge field of adjuvants that are the compounds that are used in vaccines to stimulate the immune system. Basically, we don't know how they work. We just know they do work, but we don't know why. I still think this is not the next step. I think the next step is to move from the single point to a network approach in where all these data are related one to the other, either in a prediction network or in a gene response network approach. And then you can use local topology. You can use changes to the global topology of the network to try to understand what is happening in the different subjects. And then really get the next step in the ability to understand what should I put in a vaccine to obtain from the immune system of a host the kind of response of protection of long persistence that I expect to have. So in a nutshell, my bottom line is that I really think that if we focus our attention on learning from data, how we can modulate with a vaccine the interaction between these two complex systems we can really contribute to make this world a better place where we want to be. And here's just a, uh, the really important people is, this is the core of the people that we work with that I in, have the pleasure to interact with and have been working on this. And then the reason why I'm so honored of, of being here today is because the nature of ISI as, as well as the nature of the place where I live is really interaction. And so there's many people with which we interact and collaborate all around the world. And this is really where I think the next step is possibly coming from. Thank you.